Christine Vokey from PXC International. And we are delighted tonight to have Dr. Wai Wong uh, presenting a webinar on PXE in the eye. Uh, Dr. Wong is both a clinician and a researcher in retinology at the NIH, working in the National Eye Institute. He received his undergraduate degrees at MIT in biology and chemical engineering and received his MD and PhD at Washington University in St. Louis in neuroscience and then completed an ophthalmology residency at University of Pennsylvania. Um, he also performs clinical research right now on retinal diseases, including macular degeneration and vascular eye diseases, and he's involved in clinical trials at the NA National Eye Institute. He's active in basic research as well, and his lab currently focuses on the role of microglia in the pathogenesis of retinal diseases. And uh, Dr. Wong presented um, a seminar at our 2008 meeting on PXC in the eye, and a few of you may have met him there, and we're very happy to have him back again today. Dr. Wong? Thanks so much, Terry. Uh, Chris, uh, thank you, Terry, too, for uh, your invitation, and thank you all for um, coming uh, tonight. Uh, I've not done a webinar before. I'm, I'm more used to speaking to live audiences. Uh, so uh, I do encourage you, however, to, although I can't see you, uh, to kind of ask any questions you have. Um, and I'll try to uh, get to all of them, um, you know, in the time that we do have. Um, so I know that um, in my previous presentation with um, PXC that uh, folks actually have um, a whole lot of different um, sorts of backgrounds and different degrees of um, uh, knowledge about um, PXC and also uh, retinal and retinal diseases. So what I thought I'll do is just to kind of describe in the first half an hour or so um, some aspects of um, how the eye works and how the retina works, and perhaps also go into how um, PXC affects um, the retina and the eye in uh, ways that really make a difference to um, patients. So um, I'll just start off, uh, and um, please feel free to type in your questions as I go along, and um, Chris had mentioned that uh, she would uh, try to incorporate them um, into um, and, uh, the talk as, uh, as I go along. So uh, I just wanted to um, um, tell you that uh, we are from the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, here uh, we uh, perform uh, clinical trials as well as um, uh, basic science research on many of the retinal diseases. And although some of the retinal diseases um, may be different from PXC, uh, the kind of lessons we learned there are very relevant to um, understanding um, what treatments are most appropriate uh, and also maybe some aspects on the basic biology of the retina. So um, in today's talk, I'll try to go through uh, each of the following areas. Uh, first, I'll just say a, free, a few brief words um, on the structure of the eye, um, particularly on the retina, which is the part of the eye that's most affected by PXC. And um, I'll also talk a little bit about what goes wrong uh, in the retina uh, in the case of PXC and um, follow up that with uh, some of the treatments uh, for PXC that are available um, right now, what has been used in the past, and also uh, what could be thought about in the future. And also some research questions um, uh, for PXC in the eye. Uh, some of you folks have submitted um, questions ahead of time, and uh, I have them listed um, in my presentation. I'll try to get to all of them um, in, in, um, before we're through. So um, as this may be elementary to uh, many of you, but I'll, I'll um, run the risk of being um, you know, superfluous and just talk about what the structure of the eye is. And um, the structure of the eye actually is um, not very mysterious. Actually, uh, if any of you are familiar with the structure of a camera, uh, it's actually quite similar to that. As you know, in a the camera, there's a lens on the front of the camera that focuses the light uh, to the back of the camera where there's a film, and the film actually picks up and um, the light and focuses the image in a way that um, you know makes sense to the viewer. And in the same way, um, the um, retina, the eye is also built like a camera, uh, in the sense that light comes in uh, through uh, the pupil, and there's a lens behind the pupil that focuses the light to the back of the eye, uh, where it uh, falls on the retina. And the retina is um, the part of the uh, eye um, that actually detects the light and sends information uh, to the brain so that you can make um, sense out of it. Um, your doctor, when he looks uh, at your eye in the office, and he 
or she looks through the pupil, and this is the view that he sees. Um, and the um, retina is made up of uh, a number of parts that uh, I will go through. Um, there is the optic nerve, uh, which is this round structure over here. And the optic nerve uh, is responsible for carrying the information uh, from the eye to the brain. It's like the cable that connects um, your camera to the computer. Uh, and the, the optic nerve plays a similar function. These red lines over here represent um, retina blood vessels. And they supply uh, uh, circulation and nutrients uh, to the retina itself. And um, uh, bracketed between the retinal vessels is uh, a part of the retina, which is the most important part of the retina, called the macula. And the macula is the part of the retina that is responsible for central vision. So if you're looking at a fine print, uh, you know, uh, either on a pharmacy bottle or um, a newspaper, um, that's part of um, the retina that you're actually using uh, to see fine print, uh, to recognize faces, uh, to see things uh, in your central vision. The other parts of the retina outside the blood vessels in the periphery uh, are responsible for your peripheral vision. So if you're in a car and someone pulls up alongside you, uh, that's uh, the part of the retina you're using. Uh, in PXC, uh, primarily changes occur uh, in the macula uh, part of the retina. And uh, it's also these changes in the macula part of the retina that is responsible for a lot of vision loss. Um, in PXC, and I'll get to, into this a little bit more uh, in the following slides. The retina is actually a very thin layer um, of tissue at the back of the eye, so you can imagine that if this is a camera, um, the film of the camera is a very thin um, layer of tissue uh, made up of nerve cells. And the, the overall width of the um, retina is about 200 microns, which is uh, one-fifth of one millimeter, so it's a very um, thin layer and uh, very transparent and quite fragile. The um, the retina rests on a uh, on a layer of cells called the retinal pigment epithelium, and that itself rests on a very thin um, basement membrane called Brooks membrane. And beneath Brooks membrane uh, is a system of um, blood vessels that supply the retina with um, nutrients and, um, and, and oxygen and takes away waste products. Um, the areas of the retina that we'll be talking about again in the following slides will be um, the retina itself, Brooks membrane, and also the blood vessels outside Brooks membrane. So if you, if you think about, about the, the retina as a multi-layered structure, maybe a multi-layered um, uh, pie, as it were, um, then the, um, the retina will be a filling, and then the Brooks membrane can be thought of as a structural crust uh, on which the uh, filling rests. What are the, some of the changes that occur uh, in the retina in PXC? Uh, many of you are familiar with the term uh, angioid streaks, and these um, angioid streaks are um, seen in this picture over here. You know, there are these dark lines that uh, in this case, surround the optic nerve and radiate from the optic nerve. And in this picture, you can see that they're pretty extensive. Uh, and they go around the optic nerve and also move uh, across the macula, as, in, as seen uh, in this case. And the um, location of where the android streaks are, are is located in the Brooks membrane, so the crust of the pie that I mentioned. And uh, the overlying um, retina, the filling of the pie, is actually quite, um, in the early stages, very much um, normal. And uh, these um, changes um, that represent angioid streaks actually um, cracks, as it were, uh, in Brooks' membrane. And just to compare um, uh, an eye with angioid streaks, uh, with the eye without angioid streaks, you can see that they're quite distinct. Um, uh, there are, uh, there's quite a uniform um, uh, orange color here. Here the Brooks membrane is intact and smooth, uh, whereas there's some um, cracks in Brooks membrane um, represented by these radiating lines called angioid streaks. Um, some questions that I, I get from uh, angioid, about angioid streaks concern the following. Um, I've been asked, uh, when do angioid streaks form? Uh, how are they seen, and how do they cause vision loss? Angioid streaks actually are not um, special to PXE. 
uh, there are a number of other diseases in which androgen streaks can also be seen. But a PXC is a, is a large, um, is a forms a large fraction of when uh, androgen streaks appear. Um, folks um, that have PXC um, do not have androgen streaks when they are very young um, and only develop them later on in life. And um, I think uh, there's been a number of studies uh, showing when they come about. Uh, and uh, they can come about um, as early as uh, the teenage years. Uh, and they tend to also accumulate with time. They can be seen by an ophthalmologist um, during an examination. Uh, and in some cases, um, the ophthalmologist may use imaging studies, such as in um, this case, this uh, endocyanine green uh, imaging study. Uh, in which the androgen streaks are made even more um, prominent and uh, by the passage of a dye um, through which the contrast uh, uh, between normal Brooks membrane and Brooks membrane with androgen streaks is made very evident as seen in this case. Um, the uh, ophthalmologist may also um, see um, the androgen streaks uh, using an imaging technique called uh, uh, an OCT, the Optical Coherence Tomography. And, um, and here, the android streak is viewed um, in cross-section um, by a kind of and it's a apparently kind of irregularity uh, in Brooks membrane. You can see that Brooks membrane here is quite smooth uh, and it uh, undergoes um, uh, an irregularity where the, uh, Brooks, where, where the android streak is located. Uh, android streaks can also be seen um, uh, using a fluorescein dye test. Uh, some of you uh, may have had one. Um, and in, in that case, uh, you can see that it's outlined uh, as a bright line here, uh, indicated by the position of the arrow. Why do android streaks form in PXC? Um, and it's thought that the reason why android streaks form in PS PXC is due to an abnormal thickening and um, calcification of Brooks membrane, and in one particular layer called the elastic layer. And uh, although um, the uh, calcification is quite uniform uh, and doesn't really result in any kind of obvious changes on the level of Brooks membrane, it does make the Brooks membrane uh, a lot more um, um, less flexible and more prone to cracking and breaking. So you can see in this picture here is a, a specimen of an eye um, uh, taken from a patient with uh, PXC. Uh, and the um, dark part indicates Brooks membrane, uh, and it also indicates the calcified part of Brooks membrane, as indicated by the arrow. And because the um, calcified Brooks membrane is quite uh, fragile uh, over time, and it's not quite sure you know, exactly what causes this, uh, it tends to um, locally break and crack. And the consequence of having a locally broken and cracked Brooks membrane is that um, the overlying retina um, above the androgen streak may experience a small amount of atrophy. And the environment around the androgen streak is also altered uh, in its mechanical and tissue properties. Um, besides androgen streaks, there are other early changes um, in the retina and PXC um, that uh, are helpful in uh, diagnosing the disease, but in, in and of themselves may not cause problems to the patient. Uh, one such change um, is called peau de hanche, uh, skin of the orange. Uh, and it appears here as a model fundus appearance uh, due to flat uh, yellow lesions. Uh, so that when seen um, at some distance, it looks like um, the skin of an orange. Uh, there is no um, bad consequence uh, that is known uh, from having uh, such a lesion, but it does help your doctor diagnose um, PXC uh, in a patient. Also, in some patients, uh, not in all, uh, drusen also appear in um, the optic nerve, and this is to be um, distinguished from um, drusen that are seen in uh, macular degeneration, which occurs in the retina, uh, and um, some of folks with PXA do have optic nerve drusen. and they're largely innocuous. Uh, and they are seen here as kind of lumps uh, in the optic nerve uh, of the retina. And although sometimes they can cause visual field uh, deficits, that uh, there might be some part of uh, one's peripheral vision that is um, rendered um, 
uh, incomplete uh, by the presence of um, optic nerve extrusion. But for most purposes, uh, for most cases, um, they, they are quite innocuous and uh, do not progress over time. Uh, last of all, there is a uh, so-called comet lesion. Uh, it, it consists of a um, uh, yellow body um, with a tapered tail. Um, and they're seen in the retina, usually in the periphery, in folks uh, with um, PXE. And uh, although optic nerve drusen and androic streaks can occur in um, other diseases also, uh, this comet lesion uh, is quite peculiar to PXE and uh, may be helpful for your doctor in diagnosing um, uh, diagnosing someone with a PXA based on an eye examination. Uh, these are some of the features um, that may uh, help your doctor diagnose PXC by, through um, an eye examination. Those are all the early changes that can occur in the retina due to PXC. And it's uh, really uh, due to the later changes that a, uh, a patient with PXC might lose vision. And uh, almost invariably, these losses in vision involve, to some degree, the development of, um, this is going to be a long word, choroidal neovascularization, or we call it um, CNV. Uh, and the, the, what does this mean? Um, this refers to the growth of new blood vessels from the choroid, which is the underlying series of blood vessels underneath the Brooks membrane, um, the growth of these vessels into the retina proper uh, through the crack in Brooks membrane. Uh, where the androic streaks are. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, androic streaks represent uh, local deficits uh, in Brooks membrane. And what happens is that the blood vessels that lie beneath Brooks membrane, which are normally separated from the retina by Brooks membrane, can now find their way into the retina. And when they do so, uh, the vessels that grow into the retina are abnormal and um, unusually leaky. And it's through these blood vessels that bleeding and fluid leakage may seep um, into the retina. So uh, we can imagine that, um, uh, like the film of the camera, that needs to be flat and pristine. Um, this growth of blood vessels, as well as the leakage of blood and retinal blood and fluid, can disrupt the overall retinal structure and cause scarring of the retina. And uh, with this scarring and disruption, uh, a person loses vision uh, because um, they no longer have a pristine functional uh, film, as it were, uh, to see the world with. And this is um, a depiction of what uh, can possibly happen. This is a, a picture of a normal um, retina that your doctor sees by looking um, through uh, your pupil into your eye. And this is uh, the cross-section uh, of that seen on the OCT scanning. So this is the area of the uh, retina. And you can see that it has a natural dimple in it. And everything is layered and smooth. However, when CNV develops, um, bleeding and leakage occurs in the macula, as seen over here. You can see the blood uh, leaking out from um, this central area where blood vessels have grown through. And uh, it's because of um, this invasion of blood vessels that the retina in cross-section is also disrupted. Uh, you can see that these uh, spaces form uh, in the retina um, due to the fluid that's seeping in. And the overall retina is no longer smooth, but um, quite uneven. and uh, quite um, compromised in its ability to detect light and send a message from the eye to the brain. And if your doctor also performs um, a um, dye test, as um, some of you may know, um, this dye test also can indicate the presence of um, the abnormal blood vessels uh, as um, the dye would then leak uh, from, um, from these blood vessels and show up uh, in the angiogram as seen over here. So when this happens, um, the view um, from the perspective of the patient will be a loss in central vision. Uh, the patient may have difficulty reading print and may also report there's a central dark spot in his or her vision. There may be also um, distortions in central vision, such that if you're looking at a regular grid, a normal eye will see um, all the lines as being straight. But uh, an eye with uh, um, choroidal neovascularization, uh, with new blood vessels growing through, might see the um, pattern as being distorted and uneven as seen in this case. Because the uh, retina may be also compromised in its ability to detect light, uh, patients may also do, um, report a dark spot uh, in the middle of the distortions. So these are some of the changes that can be seen from a person's point of view. 
Um, and a person uh, with um, choroidal neovascularization and uh, a damaged retina uh, sees the world quite differently from um, someone who has not had these problems. And uh, such as a normal visual scene with uh, these two young boys might appear um, like so to a normal eye. Um, that uh, in a person with um, um, choroidal neovascularization or these bleeding um, blood vessels might see the central part of that visual scene um, become uh, obscured by a dark spot. So that even if you try to move your eyes around the central part of the um, retina, um, it's always going to be um, affected. And so you, you would not be able to get rid of this uh, central distortion just by moving your eyes to the side. And um, left um, either untreated or um, left um, if it's uh, if, uh, left up to its own devices, uh, the CNV eventually um, stops bleeding, but only after um, it has caused significant scarring and permanent disruption to the structure of the retina. So in many cases, um, the destruction of retina um, does uh, entail a permanent loss of central vision. And, and in this particular case, you can see that the other oh, blood has disappeared in this eye. After a long time, um, the uh, retina in this region is, um, is scarred over um, and um, unable to do, detect light with um, great sensitivity as it had been able to do before. Uh, I'll just segue into the um, treatments uh, for PXE that are um, available. And uh, many patients have asked me, uh, is there any way to prevent completely any uh, all vision loss um, due to PXE? Is there any way to, um, for example, prevent the formation of androgenic streaks in the first place? And even after androgenic streaks have formed, is there any way to prevent the formation of these uh, abnormal blood vessels of CNV? And to answer that question, unfortunately, is that uh, right now there are no known treatments that can either um, they can perform, prevent either uh, the formation of androgenic streaks or the formation of CNV. And what uh, physicians usually tell patients with PXE is to try to um, reduce the risk of eye trauma. Um, eyes with androgenic streaks are thought to have a more fragile Brooks membrane, uh, and that uh, patients, when they're um, uh, performing sports or um, you know doing um, home maintenance, um, that these um, that they should wear eye protection uh, just in case if they would experience uh, accidental trauma uh, around the eyes that the protective eyewear, for example, can shield um, the Brooks membrane from um, trauma. And uh, in extreme cases, uh, such as this one, um, this is an example of an eye that uh, experienced uh, quite severe trauma and that this eye did have um, Brooks, uh, cracks in Brooks membrane in the form of androgen streaks and had resulted in quite a bit of hemorrhage. Um, uh, as a result of um, these many um, cracks appearing uh, as a result of trauma in, in, um, in the eye with, with um, a calcified and fragile Brooks membrane. In a, in a person uh, with angioic streaks, um, it is probably advisable that he or she uh, pays regular visits to a retinal specialist that will kind of look for uh, signs of newly emerging CNV and to recommend treatment at an early stage. Um, but in between visits, well, we do also encourage patients to um, look um, at the Namster grid. This is the grid that I showed you a few slides ago with these straight lines, and to monitor um, their vision uh, one eye at a time, and that's important to do so one eye at a time, uh, to um, detect any small distortions or blind spots that were not present, say, the day before. And uh, because early detection of these changes um, can be beneficial uh, if um, treatment is given sooner rather than later. Uh, there have been a number of treatments for CNV once CNV has occurred. Uh, although there's no prevention of CNV, uh, there are a number of treatments that um, can be effective to various degrees for the treatment of CNV. And in the past, um, laser photocoagulation, uh, which uh, is colloquially known as hot laser, uh, had been used, and this is um, um, a technique where uh, a laser is used to um, burn away uh, new blood vessels that form into the retina. The unfortunate part of this um, uh, technique is that it destroys normal tissue, 
at the same time as it destroys the CNV. Um, and so um, if your CNV is right in the center of vision, uh, there will be also um, some loss of vision um, that is noticeable to a patient at the time of um, treatment. Um, although um, in some cases the CNV goes away um, and stays away, um, there are a number of situations where the CNV, even after um, it has been cauterized, uh, does return and recur. Uh, in the more recent past, uh, a different kind of laser treatment, uh, the photodynamic therapy, or PDT, um, otherwise known colloquially as cold laser, um, has also been used. And the difference between a hot laser and a cold laser is that the um, cold laser involves the injection of a photosensitive dye into the arm, as seen over here. And as it flows from the arm into the eye, it is then activated by a laser beam. Um, this technique is more selective. It doesn't cauterize um, you know, normal tissue um, as in the case of hot laser. Um, but, uh, and there's a little bit of collateral damage, but much uh, less so. And it selectively targets the CNV for the destruction. Um, the results uh, overall uh, are uh, a little bit mixed in the sense that in some cases it may be effective in decreasing the rate of progression. Um, but complete control, permanent control, uh, is um, not usually achieved, and in some cases, many cases, uh, PET uh, may have to be repeated also. Um, in the last five years or so, um, maybe a little bit less, uh, four years or so, um, there has been a new, um, um, the event of new medications, and these involve um, so the so-called anti-angiogenic treatment. Angiogenic refers to um, the growth of blood vessels, and these treatments are actually directed at the growth of new blood vessels. And um, the growth of CNV actually relies on vascular growth factors uh, in order to grow from the choroid into the retina. And these treatments are directed against these growth factors. So you can see um, uh, this treatment here. Um, and they have names like Avastin and Lucentis and Macogen. Some of, them may be, some of you may be familiar with these names. Uh, and they're given as injections into the eye, as seen in this picture. Um, and uh, the short-term studies uh, so far show that these um, medications in binding up the growth factor that is responsible for the growth of blood vessels seem to be quite effective in reducing the fluid accumulation and the bleeding of these new blood vessels. Uh, because they don't permanently get rid of the blood vessels, uh, but they are quite effective in controlling them, um, the, the, the treatment often needs to be repeated multiple times. Uh, but um, there is also little collateral damage um, caused by these treatments, as in the case of laser photocoagulation. Um, in folks that have experienced um, perhaps CNV many years ago before the advent of uh, many of these uh, treatments, um, the retina had undergone some um, irreversible scarring. And in those situations, the treatment of long-standing vision loss is quite difficult as um, the retinal scarring has occurred and cell loss of within the retina uh, is often permanent and is um, difficult. Uh, and uh, right now to uh, think about uh, possible ways to restore um, vision to the areas where the photoreceptors of like sensitive cells are, have been um, completely um, um, destroyed. Uh, in many um, cases, um, we do recommend uh, low vision aids and rehabilitation to folks uh, with uh, permanently uh, compromised central vision. And they can be, in some people, extremely helpful um, in um, getting over um, many hurdles uh, in, in life uh, that involve vision. Um, there uh, have been, um, there has been some research going on, um, uh, both uh, for PXC as well as um, in um, treatments directed at CNB. Um, and they have, um, for example, focused on uh, the comparison of Avastin, uh, one of the drugs um, used in anti-angiogenic treatment, versus Lucentis, which is another drug uh, made by the same company. And there have been also been studies um, considering combination treatments in which um, these treatments are not used separately but together to see if they can synergize to um, produce a much uh, more effective and permanent uh, result as well as new um, uh, anti-CME therapies that are not yet approved, but under um, active investigation. 
Um, there is some information about CNV and eye diseases at our website, www.nei.nih.gov. Uh, and there is um, some information uh, about uh, the nature of um, eye disease as well as the um, new um, studies concerning eye disease. Um, I'm going to pause here for just a moment and um, ask Terry if, um, uh, and Chris if there are any um, questions um, based on uh, the material that I just spoke about. Uh, and uh, if not, uh, I have a number of questions that uh, some of you have submitted ahead of time, and I'll try to get to them one at a time. Yes, uh, Dr. Wang, we do have uh, two questions. All right. And one has to do with um, the, the question of laser versus uh, no laser, actually. In, in this day and age, this woman says she didn't have any vision trouble at all until she received laser treatment, and now she's afraid to have any more. Is it worse to get, it, it, is it, what, what are you suggesting about laser in conjunction with, or do you have any suggestions about laser in conjunction with Avastin and Lucentis? Yeah, um, I think that, um, well, I'm going to um, write down that question, and I'm going to get to that um, in just one second. I think I, I, there have been a number of questions also uh, that's been, that have been submitted about laser treatments and other, uh, whether that's a good or bad thing. And I'll, I will bring that up too. So um, this is, uh, I, I will get to that in just a minute. Perhaps uh, it would be more uh, comprehensive to kind of uh, put all the laser questions together. And your second question, Terry? Um, the, the one person asked about whether people with PXC, I'm generalizing here, whether people with PXC can uh, enter a, one of the clinical trials on Avastin or Lucentis. Uh -huh. um, I think um, I'll answer that right now. Um, in the U.S., as far as I know, there has not been yet a trial um, directed at PXC specifically. There is a, um, a trial ongoing in Germany. Uh, in Bonn, Germany, uh, in which um, folks with PXC and CNV are being recruited um, and they're being treated with Lucentis. Um, but uh, I don't know how many participants um, I'm speaking to come from Germany, but um, there is a trial ongoing right now and they're recruiting patients in which they're trying to study how effective um, Lucentis is um, for uh, PXC in, in, in the context of a clinical study. Many uh, folks with, um, you know, PXC and CNV are being treated right now uh, all across America uh, with Lucentis, uh, but this is a kind of study that's done in a systematic fashion to really kind of gather data on um, how effective it is in this context. So that's the only one that I know about right now. Okay. And this woman lives in the U.S., so that wouldn't be appropriate for her. Okay. So um, I'm just going to um, go to some of the submitted questions, um, and I've kind of organized them according to themes. And uh, one, uh, I'll just get into the first one, and this is um, the first question uh, is one that uh, talks about prevention of vision loss. I'll just read it out for everybody. Um, my husband and his brother both have PXE. His brother was told to avoid impact sports, weightlifting, and roller coasters. Um, my husband's eyes are not as bad as my his brother's, but if if either brother lifts weights or rides roller coasters, are they quickening the deterioration of the eyes or worsening the state of vessels in their eyes? Um, in terms of um, the recommendation uh, to avoid impact sports, it really gets back uh, to the fact that in, in PXC, the Brooks membrane is thought to be more f fragile uh, than in a normal person. So, uh, and thus, if the eye was to experience uh, a direct um, trauma, uh, it may um, uh, fracture and lead to bleeding more readily than a normal eye. Um, this um, thought has really been kind of animated by uh, some uh, a, a few rare cases in which um, um, the eye did, with PXC did suffer um, bad consequences as a result of trauma. But as to how um, dangerous it is across the board, um, that's not uh, been well studied. But most physicians and retinal specialists would probably recommend uh, eye protection for, um, to protect against trauma, such as uh, impact sports, you should uh, wear goggles and, um, or avoid impact sports. Um, if you were uh, you know, practicing martial arts uh, or boxing, uh, you may want to um, consider a different way to um, get your exercise. Um, However, um, weightlifting and roller coasters, uh, I think that's a lot less is known about how dangerous they are. Um, so I um, usually advise my patients to 
kind of go about life in a normal way and in, in moderation. And if they uh, were ever in uh, a situation where uh, they may be at risk for being hit on the eye to um, wear eye protection or to avoid those activities. Um, there was really nothing um, they're doing um, that would accelerate the disease. Say if um, someone lifts weight, I don't think the, the actual act of weight lifting is, is bad for the eye per se. Uh, and they're not really causing uh, an acceleration of some um, uh, de deleterious process um, that drives um, a PXC. For example, uh, it's unlikely to causing CNB to happen more readily or to uh, cause androgen streaks to occur uh, at a faster rate. So, uh, but uh, it was just a general recommendation that um, to avoid eye trauma. And uh, I have another question here um, on um, the course of PXC disease. And uh, I'll, I'll read this out to you. Um, the question says, I have PXC, and I have had my eyes checked annually for android streaks. And I do have one in each eye. They're not near the macula uh, as of the last checkup. Will I be affected by blindness because of these streaks? Uh, if so, uh, is there average age timeline in which this uh, will take place? What can I expect if it does? Will it be gradual? Um, are there any uh, current treatments that can prevent or treat these streaks? Um, so the um, the question is uh, uh, talking about uh, streaks that are not in the uh, center of vision. Maybe uh, right now they're off to the side and not um, you know the, the, through the very center of the macula. Um, so uh, in response to that, CMV always occurs in the location of the streaks. Uh, it's very rare for CMV to occur outside the streaks. So um, CNV, if it occurs, uh, it's always kind of advantageous if it occurred away from the very center. Um, that means that um, the most important part of the, of the retina is um, more spared and less damaged by the CNV. Um, uh, someone with uh, CNV in um, an off-center location might notice some change in the more peripheral vision. Uh, and, uh, and as such, the AMSA grid may be helpful. Uh, in detecting some some of these subtle changes, um, CNV can grow in size uh, if left untreated. So the fact that it arose um, uh, off center, uh, but if uh, left untreated, is is possible that these lesions can grow in size and spread into the center. So um, while uh, it's always good to have them farther away to the center, um, they should be given attention so that uh, they do not grow and extend uh, to move into the center. When does CNV occur uh, in the context of android streak? Uh, I think this is largely quite unpredictable. Uh, and um, a large scale study uh, has not uh, really uh, been done to contribute to uh, really good numbers to estimate that. Uh, PXC, as you, all of you know, is a pretty rare disease. And uh, so far, um, we haven't had the ability to collect a large number of people in one place. Uh, to do an overall um, general survey study as to at what age is the um, kind of most likely age for for folks to develop CNV uh, if they have android streaks. So I think it's very hard right now, uh, and we don't have the information to um, say um, to give very kind of strong recommendations about when um, CNV does form in someone in PXC at what age. Uh, the formation of CNV uh, sometimes is gradual, so people do notice uh, kind of um, a slight change in the vision, and, and then over a matter of days, it gets worse and worse. Uh, and it can also occur quite suddenly. For example, patients may report that uh, they were fine going to bed um, one night. Uh, when they woke up, they realized that in the left eye, there's a dark spot and distorted vision they didn't notice the day before. So, um, so it can be somewhat gradual, but it also can occur quite quickly. Are there any treatments to prevent or treat these streaks? Uh, right now, there is not. So we can um, neither prevent these streaks from forming, uh, nor uh, prevent a CNV once these streaks have formed. So I'll move on to the uh, next question. And uh, this question is also a question about the course of PXCI disease. Um, and the questioner asks, uh, given the recent advancements, is it true that blindness is no longer considered a certainty? Um, I want to um, go into um, the concept of blindness. So blindness means different things to different people, and it means different things to physicians also. Someone who is suffering from uh, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, inherited eye disease, may complete 
may become completely blind in that um, the world will seem completely dark and um, such a person would need um, a cane to get around or a seeing eye dog uh, because you know all he or she sees is, is darkness. Um, such a situation is very unlikely in a person with, with PXE, even um, in the worst case scenario. Uh, this, the reason for that is because uh, vision loss in PXC usually occurs as a result of um, CNV, and CNV tends to form either at the macula or near the macula, uh, and it's very rare for it to um, affect any sort of compulsion of the periphery. So uh, most people, even in very severe cases, will have peripheral vision, and with that, they can um, they can walk unaided from room to room. Uh, they uh, would be able to, um, you know. Um, kind of go places uh, without special assistance. They will, of course, um, may have uh, difficulties uh, in, in, in severe cases reading fine print, uh, recognizing faces, driving, um, but um, it's very, very unlikely that a person, as in the second question, a person, it's very unlikely that this person will go completely blind as a result of PXE, even in the most severe cases. So uh, you would, in almost all cases, retain peripheral vision. Uh, on, uh, in the next question, um, the questioner asks, I have geographic atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium and notice a degra de degradation in my eyesight on a daily basis. Is there something that can be done to slow down this degeneration? This is something we haven't uh, really spoken uh, about up to this point. Um, and uh, the question is talking about uh, a kind of a loss of, um, of cells in, 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 the, um, in the retina. Uh, as a result of PXE. So we've talked about CNB, which is a very kind of destructive um, um, process due to the bleeding of blood vessels. Uh, but either in the aftermath of that bleeding, after the bleeding had subsided and gone away, uh, or even in the case where there had been no bleeding at all, just the presence of androgen streaks, um, that these influences um, may have um, sufficiently injured the retina so that at a ver much slower rate, uh, they begin to fall away little by little, um, even without overt bleeding and destruction. So this is what she's referring to, or he's referring to, as geographic atrophy. There's a slow uh, atrophic uh, dropping away of the cells that are necessary uh, to see in the retina. Um, in PXC, this is a much more um, slow process and um, affects only a minority of people. Um, and um, there is, uh, unfortunately, nothing that we know um, that can, uh, right now, that can be effectively uh, used to slow down this degeneration. Uh, I'll, I'll probably talk about uh, this kind of uh, atrophic process um, just uh, later on in some questions, too. Um, and um, we're switching over to treatments for PXC now. And uh, in this question, um, the question is asked, is, is there more information regarding Avastin and Lucentis, such as what exactly they do and what are the possible side effects? Are there any natural herbs and oils that are alternative to chemical treatments? Um, Avastin and Lucentis are actually uh, protein molecules um, that uh, are similar to antibodies, um, defense molecules that our immune system uses to uh, attack microbes. And they inject it to the eye because they are capable of binding up the growth factors um, that um, drive the formation of CNV. Um, so that's their physical and chemical property, as it were, uh, that their proteins that do um, the job in such a way. Um, the side effects of um, Avastin and Lucentis um, are actually quite um, uncommon. Um, they are given as an injection into the eye, so whenever a needle is placed in the eye, um, or any part of the body for the matter, there's always a risk for um, damage to tissue and a risk for um, infection, um, given that whenever you put a foreign body into um, a body part, there's always a, a chance uh, that, uh, for, um, that microbes, et cetera, will be introduced. Uh, but these risks uh, are quite low. They're uh, on the scale of um, one per 10,000, for example. Um, so, but nevertheless, there's a real risk, and uh, the injection should be um, uh, performed by someone who's properly trained, um, 
uh, preferably, preferably a, a retinal uh, doctor who has done many of such injections, um, and uh, taking all the kind of precautions that are necessary to avoid injury and um, infection. Uh, so there is a risk simply by uh, simply on the basis of in, of the injection, uh, but these risks, although it sounds scary to put a needle in someone's eye or have a needle put in your eye, uh, is actually fairly well tolerated, and the uh, risks are quite low. But as far as the medication themselves, um, do they have a risk? Um, there is uh, on the level of the eye. Uh, a, a small risk again of uh, um, of the eye being coming inflamed as a result of this uh, injection, uh, but again there are uh, on the level of one per um, several thousand, and um, and there is also um, a rare risk of uh, these medications um, uh, causing um, a risk for cardiovascular complications. Of these include heart attacks and strokes. Again, um, one and um, a couple of uh, thousand is actually quite um, uh, a, a low rate. Uh, on balance, um, because Avastin and Lucentis in the last uh, few years have been used quite extensively in um, uh, many people, um, uh, even folks in the 80s and 90s are quite advanced in age, um, and on the whole they have done more um, good than harm. So if someone uh, has a um, CNV form in the eye and has experienced uh, acute loss of vision um, last week, for example, um, these drugs um, generally, although there are always exceptions to that rule, uh, generally can be of benefit um, to the patient. I'm not aware of any natural herbs and oils that um, can be effective uh, in such a context. Um, uh, uh, there are eye vitamins that uh, people may take for a macular degeneration, uh, but in the uh, situation of um, of a uh, CNV that's um, formed and active, uh, I do not know of any um, such um, alternative treatments um, that have been demonstrated to have any um, a similar kind of uh, effectiveness. Uh, this is another question on um, uh, treatments of PXC. Uh, and the questioner asks, I have um, eye bleed. I was recommended to get a Lucentis shot and to get a laser. I've read that laser can lead to more eye bleeds. The doctor told me that uh, laser is more of a permanent fix than the Lucentis shot. I was told that I would probably need the shot once a month for the rest of my life. Can you give me more information on laser treatment? And this is probably a good time to also bring up the other question that um, uh, Chris uh, mentioned about uh, uh, whether um, laser treatment um, can, um, can be recommended. And uh, although um, in the case of um, someone, it sounds like um, um, he or she uh, was quite asymptomatic, and then um, you know after the laser was uh, delivered, uh, developed um, uh, a blind spot there were in, there was none. So um, I think that laser um, is more and more um, rare in its application um, at this point in time. I think. Um, uh, the the disadvantage of a laser treatment is primarily is um, because it, it destroys um, some normal tissue in addition to abnormal tissue, and um, and there is an alternative around that. That's always something that uh, is um, is welcome and should be considered. Um, the laser is um, not always a permanent fix, in a sense that although it cauterizes um, the tissue. Uh, it may be possible for the CNV to return. Um, and if it does return, uh, more treatment is, is probably necessary. Um, as far uh, as how it compares to, um, in this case, the Lucentis shot, uh, it is very true that the uh, Lucentis, um, because it enters the eye and it it's, um, doesn't last forever, um, that it needs to be repeated um, uh, at um, at the most, once a month. It's unlike it's, un, it's unusual to give it more frequently once a month. Uh, but as to how often this um, um, treatment needs to be repeated out into the future, how many months uh, do we need to give this treatment? Really, uh, would I think depend on a case by case basis. Um, in the case of PXC, there is not very good information uh, owing to the uh, rareness of PXC. Um, as to how 
how it should be given and how uh, long it should be given for. So um, my patients with PXA, I kind of evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis to determine um, what uh, treatment is best for them and also how um, frequently and also how many times to give um, the treatment. Um, the next question uh, refers also to um, um, the treatment of PXC. Uh, the questioner says um, uh, that he, he or she experienced uh, his first leak in February 2009, which is a few months ago. Um, a retinal specialist proposed a treatment plan of three Avastin injections plus PDE treatment, so both things. Um, after becoming more educated about current treatment regimes, I'm finding that laser is not often used. I'm bothered by the approach my doctor used and more bothered if anything comes up in the future. I live in the area of the country where only one group of retinal, uh, with only one group of retinal specialists. The nearest um, other group would be about three hours away. I realize it's important to react quickly if a problem occurs so that I'm somewhat perplexed about what to do if I have a problem in the future. I can't tell, really tell my doctor as the expert not to do the laser therapy, but I'm not convinced I want it. How would you handle a delicate situation like this? Um, the question is correct, uh, that uh, it's uh, probably important uh, in someone with VXC uh, to, um, to seek medical attention if, um, the, if one's vision has changed um, significantly all of a sudden. And I think there's not much to worry about if, um, uh, if um, the vision is you know, slightly obscured and if you rub your eyes and the obscuration goes away and that's not CNV. Uh, but however, um, if um, uh, there is a sudden occurrence of distorted vision or a blind spot and you know, is there uh, today, is there tomorrow, um, that probably um, needs to be looked at um, soon. Uh, it's not an emergency that you have to you know, get up at 3 a.m. in the morning and run to the doctor, but I would not put it off for more than a week um, if um, this distortion is, 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 is um, persistent. So uh, because there is um, some um, advantage to uh, treating the, um, uh, the, the, the bleeding uh, if, it were, if it is existing uh, as soon as possible. And uh, that um, sometimes um, does mean a better outcome in the long run. Um, and uh, this uh, question is um, asking about a combined treatment plan, which is uh, a Vastin plus PDT laser treatment. So unlike um, the hot laser treatment, which is um, destructive in nature, PDT is more selective in nature. It can um, lead to some level of tissue damage, but this tish level of tissue damage is much lower than that uh, with the hot laser. And um, whether this combined treatment uh, you know, Avastin plus PDT is better than just Avastin alone, or just PDT alone. Um, it's not quite understood in the context of PXC. Again, um, there are similar um, diseases such as um, macular degeneration, uh, in which such an approach seems to be uh, a combined approach seems to have some uh, added advantage. Uh, but in PXC, that's not quite clear. Um, so I think that. Um, it is important to have a conversation uh, with one's doctor about um, uh, the reasons underlying a treatment plan, uh, be it just a vaccine alone or PDT alone or both. Um, and um, it does also vary uh, from patient to patient. Um, and the, you know, the size of the CNV sometimes can change, uh, can be different from patient to patient. Uh, the location of the CNV is really important. Uh, if it's right in the center of vision, that might indicate one kind of treatment versus another. Um, so it's very important to um, understand um, the, the, kind of, uh, the reasons for um, uh, uh, why your doctor recommend, recommends a treatment. And um, I often um, uh, kind of um, uh, encourage patients to, um, um, to have the doctor explain it to them. And in the case where the treatment plan doesn't sound like something they're comfortable with or something they understand, uh, to seek a second opinion. Um, I certainly um, uh, encourage my patients to um, to tell me how they feel about um, the treatment, and if they don't want the treatment, um, you know, certainly uh, I encourage them to, to seek a second opinion. So I think that uh, you can always tell your doctor, um, and I encourage my patients to tell me um, that um, you know they are feeling um, uncertain or um, about the treatment. They, they they should certainly voice their concerns. Uh, it's perfectly fine to do so uh, from my point of view.
Um, and I'll get um, to the next question. Uh, I've been receiving a vast of injections for bleeding. Um, however, uh, my vision is still impaired. Uh, my doctor says I have thinning on my retinas. I'm wondering um, if you know of any treatments for um, or prevention of this worsening of vision. Um, also, an explanation of what thinning of the retina means um, is um, is asked for so that um, this question I can understand it. Um, so I think that Vastin injections, uh, in this particular case, um, uh, may refer may may be successful in controlling the CNV formation and the bleeding and the leakage. However, um, the um, retina that is in the area of the bleeding of, of the, and the leakage uh, may have experienced um, some permanent um, um, damage. So over time, even after the bleeding has been controlled, uh, the retina in the aftermath of um, this disruption slowly uh, becomes more atrophic. Um, so that may be uh, what this thinning refers to. Um, the retina is uh, often of a kind of normal thickness, uh, and um, the swelling of the retina might occur when a lot of fluid and blood are kind of rushing into it, just like uh, if you experience trauma in your hand and your leg, you might have a lot of um, bleeding and swelling of tissues. So this is something similar to that. Um, but after that's um, undergone, um, you know, control by treatment, um, the tissue might um, become more atrophic over time. So cells begin to fall away, and the tissue as a whole becomes more thin as a result. So that's what um, that thinning of the retina refers to. Is there any um, treatment that can prevent this worsening? There are a number of things that are being investigated right now, um, such as growth factors that encourage uh, sustain and um, uh, the retina cells um, and um, um, protect the neurons in the retina. Uh, but uh, those are still under investigation. So there's nothing that's approved right now uh, that's been demonstrated um, to um, support uh, the retina cells and prevent this thinning. So um, the answer is um, right now, not just yet, although that's um, a subject of a number of clinical investigations right, uh, at, at the present moment. Um, last, I think getting to the end, um, we uh, have a question on the use of stem cells that can uh, be used to reconstruct part of the retina that has been destroyed by hot laser in the past. Um, and is this at all possible? Um, it's stem cells, as you know, uh, has been getting a lot of uh, attention, uh, both in the press as well as um, uh, in scientific journals. Uh, scientists are very excited about uh, using stem cells uh, because it um, gives us the tools to um, try to um, reconstruct neural tissue uh, that has been lost. So neurons, um, uh, unlike you know skin or hair, um, can't really grow back because they're not capable of multiplying and, um, and populating the errors uh, that have been um, damaged. So um, the only way to um, get tissue back in those errors is either to transplant tissue or, or to um, get stem cells, uh, which are cells that have, uh, which are capable of um, dividing, and uh, from a very simple kind of cell form, they can uh, differentiate to become all kinds of cells in the body, uh, liver cells, skin cells, uh, even neurons, um, uh, these uh, photoreceptors that can uh, perhaps confer the ability to detect light again. The um, challenges for um, having these stem cells do that uh, are still not uh, completely solved. And actually, with, we're, we're, as a field, we're, we're kind of learning some important lessons, but uh, we haven't um, you know, gotten all our uh, in a role to be able to accomplish the task at hand. The many challenges, um, meaning uh, how, you know, where to get these stem cells from, how do you introduce stem cells into the body so that they would not be um, destroyed by the immune system and they would survive in the body, how do you uh, tell the stem cell to become a photoreceptor cell and not a lover cell, um, and once you form a photoreceptor, how do you get this photoreceptor to then connect with the other um, neurons in the uh, in the eye and then play the message uh, from the eye to the brain. Um, so there are a lot of other challenges that um, that uh, need to be solved and uh, folks are kind of taking uh, one, it, things one step at a time uh, so that uh, in animal models, I think um, in mice and rats, 
uh, investigators have been trying to solve um, each of those problems piecemeal. So um, I think that there's, um, they have the potential uh, to do this in the future, um, that um, the part of the retina that's been destroyed either by scarring or by hot laser um, may uh, potentially be repopulated um, by uh, stem cells, which can then differentiate and become uh, photoreceptor cells. Uh, but um, there is not yet a clinical trial um, testing this approach right now. Uh, and um, to my mind, uh, there are still um, uh, a number of um, um, challenges that need to be met. And uh, although you know everyone's working hard on meeting those challenges one by one, um, this is not um, a therapy, I think, that will be widely available in the next few years, unfortunately. Um, I think I've gone to the end of um, uh, the list of questions that uh, have been submitted. Um, and um, I was going to just ask Chris or Terry uh, if anyone else has uh, any other questions at this point. Uh, thank you for um, this wonderful presentation. We have two more questions. Um, one is a man who's 61 years old and has had loss of central vision for 10 years due to PXC. And he's starting to develop cataracts now. And he wonders what are the pros and cons of cataract surgery mm -hmm. uh, to help with further, reduce any further vision loss. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I think that uh, I'm just going to try to connect the um, maybe probable dots here and uh, say that um, in this case, it's probably likely that um, um, this um, person has um, developed CME in the past and, um, and uh, central vision has been um, kind of compromised due to the scarring process that has taken place. Um, the um, formation of cataracts is probably um, something that occurs um, independently of PXC. And um, I think that if they're getting um, in the way of he uh, of his seeing better, uh, in the sense that um, uh, you know taking out the cataracts will probably not help him see much better than he did you know 20 years ago. Uh, but may um, help him um, see better um, than he did, say, five years ago before the cataracts became um, denser and, as it were, more ripe. Um, there is no um, known downside uh, to taking out the cataracts at this point. Uh, it would not make, uh, you, it would not, probably not re-energize any kind of bleeding. Um, and, um, and I generally recommend my, um, to my patients if the cataract is preventing um, sufficient light from getting into the eye, uh, that they can be removed uh, safely. Uh, although I would um, do two other things. I would inform my cataract surgeon um, about the diagnosis of PXC so that um, he can um, be aware that um, he's dealing with a Brooks membrane that's more fragile, and he may change his surgical approach to um, accommodate the eye as much as possible. And the second thing is that after the cataract has been removed, uh, I would um, uh, pay a visit to, to my retinal uh, um, doctor just to make sure uh, there is no recurrence of, um, of bleeding. Um, uh, I don't think that there is any known increased risk, but I, I would do that just to be sure. Thank you for that answer. Sure. Uh, the uh, other person is someone who attended your um, lecture at our meeting in the fall, last fall. Okay. And you mentioned that any one of them could come to you for a free consultation. And uh, she wonders if that's still available, and if so, how do you access that? I think most uh, patients uh, uh, come to us uh, uh, through a referral by their um, retina doctor. Um, and um, uh, usually um, the... Um, doctor sends over um, some information about a patient, the tests that um, have been done uh, before, and um, so that um, you know we can um, evaluate the patient and provide a second opinion um, to um, that the patient may be looking for. Uh, we uh, generally keep patients at the NEI um, on a continuing basis. Uh, usually because they qualify for a clinical trial. Uh, we unfortunately are not able to take um, everybody um, for their regular um, clinical care. Um, you know, we, we, are, we have a pretty small clinic and most of our continuing patients are in, enrolled in a clinical trial. But oh, we're generally happy to uh, take referrals and to provide a second opinion um, to, to folks that are interested. 
I think that um, if um, this um, uh, this questioner uh, would uh, like to uh, leave um, uh, his or her details um, with PXC International, um, I can uh, get back in touch um, with uh, with him or her and um, uh, and kind of provide some directions as to how um, this can be uh, done. Okay. Would that be okay? Yes, I'll, um, we, we would be happy to be the uh, go-between in that Okay, thank you. To you. Um, and there, I have no more questions um, in our question pane here. Um, oh, yes, I do. Where are you located? <laughs> but you are at the, uh, can you tell them where you're located again? Dr. Wong? Uh, I'm located at uh, the Bethesda, uh, Maryland, uh, on the NIH campus. Uh, and the National Institute is part of um, uh, the Nas National Institutes of Health, and um, that's where we are. We are about um, a half an hour outside um, um, the uh, Washington D.C. And um, I wanted to mention some uh, a record study that PXC International is um, undertaking uh, along with NIH. Um, if any of you who are listening have had treatments with any of the anti-angiogenesis drugs, so Avastin, Lucentis, or Macugen, we would like to see your, have copies of your medical records for a records review study to try to quantify uh, how those drugs are helping people with PXC uh, because there aren't any studies on PXC yet. So if you um, would like to submit your records, you can um, call us at the office for information, but we, we just need the records that have to do with your Avastin, Lucentis, or Macugen treatments. So if you'd like to participate, we would be very appreciative. Um, if you have any other questions after this webinar, you can send them to info at pxc.org or call the office, and you see the number on the screen, 202-362-9599. Um, Dr. Juan, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative, and um, I'm sure it helped a lot of people understand what's going on.